Hi, I'm Sarah Jones. Welcome to this digital edition of the Northern Ireland Science Festival. We're delighted to have Merlin Sheldrake in conversation with Simon Watt on his book, Entangled Life. Please make sure to click subscribe and like, um, and a big thanks to all of our panellists today. Hello and welcome to Northern Ireland Science Festival Online. My name is Simon Watts. I'm a scientist, a biologist and science presenter. And it is really nice to be here. I'm zooming in from London, but I'm a proud child of Northern Iron. It's so good that the festival is continuing in spite of this pandemic. And welcome and thank you for joining us. It's not just me, of course, though. I'm here to talk to Marilyn Sheldrick, the author of this fantastic book, Entangled Life. When the festival sent me this, I have to say it was a real joy, Marilyn. And if you do want to check it out and you're in Belfast, to go to the festival's official bookshop, uh, No Alibi. Merlin, where are you coming from today? I'm coming from Newark. Newark. And what mm -hmm. takes you to Newark? Because I know you are actually a scientist at Cambridge still, is that correct? Well, no, I, I left Cambridge a, a few years ago when I started writing this book. And, um, and I normally live in London, but I'm in Newark right now because of the, the circumstances. It's my, it's my, my family, um, the, the hometown of my father's family. So uh, it's a good place for me to be. Um, quite a place to be. So Merlin, I think we should probably dive into uh, into your book here because it is an excellent account of not just facts about these fungi, but your sort of personal relationship and love of them. Um, could you tell us a little bit about its conception and where it started? What was the thing which prompted you to take on the subject? Well, I think my interest in fungi goes back a very long way. Uh, I've always been interested in the way things transform and change and uh, fungi oversee so many of the transformations um, within which we live, these big uh, biogeochemical transformations. Um, so as a child, you know, how does, I would ask these questions like, how does a, a, a log become soil? You know, how do compost heaps rot into the ground? And what is, what is that? Um, who does that? Um, and you can't really ask these questions for long without running into fungi. And so I was always curious about these creatures that lived out of sight, but yet were responsible for so much. Uh, and later on, I got into them more and more because of my study of symbiosis, the way that organisms have found to live alongside one another and continually invent new ways to live alongside one another. And fungi are real uh, blockbuster symbionts in some of the big relationships that have shaped life on Earth. And so um, this took me to my study of plants and their relationships with fungi that live in their root, mycorrhizal fungi. And, and then that continued to blossom. And the more you think about fungi, the more you want to know. It's one of these funny uh, features of the fungal kingdom. Most people that I know who, who think about fungi or study fungi, they, they're just uh, sliding down this helter skelter of ever deepening fascination. And it just, um, the, the, yeah, the, more, the more you learn, the more you want to ask. Well, it does seem to be a good time for those questions because they are surprising the uh, dominion of life in that they are sort of so ubiquitous and, and your book very much highlights their presence across the the animal and the plant kingdom as these symbionts and as parasites but they do seem to have been kind of largely overlooked um, any mycologist any people studying fungi that I've ever met have kind of been underdogs in the field of biology can you perhaps tell me why why do you think is this the time why are fungi at last getting their due <laughs> I think there are a few reasons. Uh, one of them is a technological. We simply have uh, more ways to, to examine the fungal world, to make visible um, the fungal world than we did before. DNA sequencing, for example, allows us to grind up a, a little pinch of soil and to, um, to work out who's living there. Whereas before, using microscopes, you simply wouldn't be able to distinguish uh, the great fungal diversity that can exist in even you know, a pinch of soil. Um, and that's also why the study of microbes in general is, is booming, because these technologies have granted access to uh, the microbial world in general, not just the fungal world. But it, um, So one is this, this question of access. Um, another is taxonomic. So fungi were only thought of as their, uh, their own kingdom of life in the 60s. They won their independence, taxonomically speaking, in, in the, as late as the 60s, which always uh, amazes me. And and so before that, they were lumped in with plants. And so rather than have their own departments, their departments of fungal sciences, they were usually studied in the dusty corner of departments of plant sciences. So it entrenched a kind of disciplinary bias, uh, which has led to their neglect in, in the academy. But there are other reasons, I think, why they're having a boom right now. And um, one is the uh, sort of general ecological turn as we become more aware of the seething networks of relationships that we're bound up with, you know, as ecological crises worsen. Um, 
people are starting to take a, a more ecological view, um, thinking about the relationships between organisms as much as you know, organisms in themselves. And fungi are fundamentally connected organisms. They form living networks that string organisms together. And so they kind of embody this basic principle of, of ecology. So I think that's another reason. Um, and of course, another reason is, is the rise of network thinking. Um, networks become a kind of master concept dri driven in part by, our, um, by the digital networks. Uh, that we live our lives uh, in, in, with and um, but not just that network thinking has now become um, a way to understand all sorts of disciplines um, all sorts of areas of, of life and the human life and, and fungi as living networks kind of um, they jive with that, uh, that that network mentality so those are a few reasons I think there are even more than um, well, I must say I agree with you in that terms of the kind of being siloed I've, I've been lucky enough to do some work with Kew Gardens and everybody there who works in fungi have, I feel like they should all be wearing leather jackets. They've got a slight air of cool and, and detachedness and knowing that they are perhaps actually having to fight their corner, but therefore doing it ferociously. But, but to my mind, the thing which makes your, your book so, so brilliant, because I have genuinely really loved reading it, is not just the fact that you are telling us as astounding facts about fungi, but you're also managing to somehow convey the sort of experience of fungi, like be that you're telling me about the heady aromas of uh, truffles or kind of queer theory relating to lichens or even your personal experiences of LSD and how fungi have literally impacted your mind from this. Um, I was like, could you perhaps delve into like, maybe even give some examples as to how you've, you've managed that. Like what is the experiential side of fungi that you've really managed to bring out in this? Yeah, I mean, it's a I always think of it as fighting and losing battle, you know, because we're, we're never going to, despite our best efforts, we're never going to really be able to understand what it's like to be a filamentous microbe. Um, but we can try, right? We can try to decenter our human perspective. And this is, I think, the main, um, the main challenge is to um, not necessarily to become a fungus or to, to, or to believe that we can become a fungus, but to put, try our best to set aside some of our biases, our, our deeply entrenched sensory biases, our cultural biases, um, our physical um, our biases. And um, so that's what I've been really trying to do. And, and despite it being a, 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 um, a losing battle to, to own up to doing it in the process of writing the book, just because um, not only do I think it's important for us to try and... Um, to, to loosen the grip of our, our, our species narcissism and exceptionalism, but also because I think it's fun um, to, to do this. So for example, when I'm talking about mycelium and mycelium is these branching fusing networks of, of cells that make up most of fungal life and only a few species, well, quite a lot, but a small proportion of the fungal world produce mushrooms and mushrooms are only the fruits of fungus. So um, this is just uh, one small aspect of the fungal kingdom and all the things they can do and um, so mycelium is this very astonishing growth form and, and much of my time writing the book was trying to trying to come to terms with this this growth form mycelium now how, how do we how can we understand something which is so indeterminate there's no body plan there's no fixed pattern of growth and then mycelium will pour itself into its environment wherever it happens to be and so one way that I tried to understand mycelium was to think about where are the parts of our lives that we are most indeterminate? You know, our bodies are very determinate. If you're born with two arms, if you don't have an accident or any kind of other kind of intervention, you'll, you'll end up with two arms. And um, it's not like that for a fungus. So where are we in our lives most indeterminate? And I think in our minds, you know, our, the, our patterns of thought, our behaviors, these are all uh, much more flexible than, than our bodies. And so I started to imagine the ways that um, we think and the ways that we, um, imagine as in some sense uh, the most fungal part of ourselves because these are the part of ourselves which are, which are not um, predetermined in in rigid body plans so that's just one way that I one way in as an example but with this kind of exercise I found it very um, very rewarding to, to pursue this. Well, I feel before we get to, too deep into the sort of philosophical feeling like a fungi um, we might have to go back to brass tacks can you please give us just a bit of a your kind of overview your view of how fungi got here, how they gained their ubiquity and their strength. Maybe take us back to the start. Mm. Well, they've, they're a very old kingdom of life and they're more closely related to animals than to plants. Um, 
but they're responsible for much of life as we know it on the planet. So, for example, plants could only make it out of the water. The ancestors of plants could only make it out of the water and onto the land with the help of fungal partners. Um, the fungal partners could digest um, or scavenge for nutrients in the soil and could acquire water from the soil and, and could support the um, migration of these algae onto land and support the evolution of what we now think of as plants. And so that's just one example of the way that fungi have shaped um, so much of, uh, of life and, 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 and created the conditions um, for so much of what we, what we now think of as, of as life. So they're, they're, they have a very long-standing and um, pivotal role in the bios biosphere and, um, and have been around for a very long time, um, over a billion years of fungal evolution. Yeah, but you're saying there that they are, are again, a, a requirement, really, that the, this move of plants from the sea onto the land really wouldn't have happened without them. In, in the book, it seems to detail particularly how root systems, so the plants may well become the sort of king of above the surface, but below the soil, it's really even now the fungi that still rule the roost. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and for 50 million years or so, when plants were uh, evolving into um, more recognisable forms on on land, uh, they didn't actually have roots and fungi behaved as their root systems for all of that time. So plant roots followed fungi into being. Um, and today, you know, over 90% of plants depend on the fungi that live in their roots, um, as you say. And so we really can't think about, say, a plant without thinking also about the fungi that make the, the life of that plant possible. And these plants are, are symbiotic organisms like so many other organisms on the planet. Perhaps one of the better illustrations you talk about that is a, is a blue flower. Um, which doesn't appear to photosynthesize. Um, I think that's an excellent example of uh, showing the pivotal role of fungi within the plant world. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was talking about a plant called uh, Voiria, which is a plant that I studied in, in Panama when I was working in the tropical forest there. Uh, and this plant was always captivating to me because it's, it didn't have green, so it, was, it, it didn't have leaves either. So these features of planthood, which I normally think of as non-negotiable, uh, actually are not non-negotiable features of planthood. And these plants had left photosynthesis behind, um, and they'd only been able to do so because they could plug into fungal networks and draw from these fungal networks not only the nutrients they needed to survive, but also the energy-containing carbon compounds like sugars or lipids that they needed to survive. But those energy containing carbon compounds were actually being drawn from nearby photosynthetic plants um, that were in, in a relationship with these fungi. Um, and then these, these non-photosynthetic plants were able to draw this material via the fungal network from other plants. And so this is um, embodying this idea of the wood wide web, right? That plants are socially networked by fungi. And, and so these plants, which don't have the ability to photosynthesize by themselves, give a very clear example of quite how much is possible, quite how much these fungal networks are doing um, for plants, because uh, they are in fact the entire life support system of, 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 these, of these flowers, which is one of the reasons I was so um, captivated by them. Yeah, I suppose it seems to be the more we dig, uh, the more entangled and enmeshed everything is. So actually, just to delve in there, because we can see that uh, the plant, sorry, we can see that fungi have played such a pivotal role in the movement, say, of the plants from the water to the land, and therefore affected all of life and earth really through that. But it isn't just plants. So humans and animals are affected by fungi as well. In many ways, you can almost think it was the animal as acting as part of the extended phenotype, as part of uh, the fungus's life instead. Could you delve a bit more into that? Because we can now see how it's pivotal to plants. But how about to you and me and all the other animals? Well, the most striking example, um, which you hinted at there, is the insects which are uh, possessed by fungi, which borrow their bodies, which commandeer their bodies and um, puppet their behavior in such a way that the fungus can achieve some um, to complete its life cycle. So the best examples are ants, which are infected by a fungus called Ophiocordyceps. And this fungus grows through the ant's body and it overrides the ant's basic instincts, which are to say low um, on the forest floor. And the ant becomes fascinated by heights. It's a syndrome called summit disease. The ant climbs up the stalk of the nearest plant uh, and then bites on to the underside of a leaf in what's called a death bite. And the death bite and summit disease, these are 
totally, uh, they're not ant behaviors, they're fungal behaviors. Um, the fungus, the ant is a fungus in ants clothing because the fungus is really in the driving seat here. Uh, and then once the ant is clamped on, the, the fungus having got it there, having got it to clamp on, and then kills the ant and sprouts a stalk out of its head from which spores rain down on ants passing below. And um, there are many examples of this across the fungal kingdom and, and across the, the insect world. It's, it's a strategy that's evolved multiple times independently. And it's a, perhaps one of the, well, it's more of the, one of the more extreme examples of animal and fungal relations. Um, and uh, a grisly one at that. But there are many others. So in the insect world, you also have, um, say, leafcutter ants or termites, which have tens of millions of years of agriculture. Um, these termites and these leafcutter ants, they, they cultivate fungi in huge mounds. And these fungi produce, uh, they, they're what they um, eat. Um, they don't just cultivate these fungi, but they cultivate um, bacteria which uh, defend their crop from a ferocious parasitic fungus that can rip through their um, rip through their crop and destroy the colony. So there's a very sophisticated um, system of agriculture which has existed for tens of millions of years before humans got close uh, to what we think of as um, agriculture. So fungi and, and animals have been um, dancing together in evolutionary terms in, in, in all sorts of ways and for a very long time. And, and we're late comers to the story. I love that story in particular, Marilyn, just because uh, there isn't a single day that goes by that I don't think I've made massive mistakes in my life and should have dedicated to the study of ants. But you know, I may be changing my mind. I should be studying the fungi instead. <laughs> but it's, it's that kind of complexity, isn't it, really, that what we're seeing there is, is a balance of symbiosis of working together with the, the, the cloak and dagger of, of parasitism as well. And that these two seemingly opposite things are actually just right next to each other. So fungi seem to to constantly be opportunists in this, always working either together with their the things that surround them or against them. And in biology, we seem to be much more happy or have historically been more embracing the kind of nature red and tooth and claw idea than this one of, of constantly working together. Um, so actually, maybe let's delve a little bit more into that symbiosis, because I know you love it as well. Could you take everybody who's listening here through basically the life of a lichen? Because it's one of the parts that, even though I'm a biologist, I find so deeply fascinating in your book, because it seems always to be prompting new questions from something that when you look at it, it's just a splodge that we see everywhere in our world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're amazing. And... Um, so lichens are people who have seen them. I mean, you, you see them growing on roofs and fence posts and gravestones, uh, trees. And, um, but lichens are not just one organism as they appear to be when you first look at them. They look like some kind of scrubby um, plant. But actually they're a symbiotic organism. They're, they're a, um, a living ecology. They're made up of more than one, not just two organisms, but actually usually more than two. Um, so a, a fungal partner, which provides um, provides a lot of the tissue that you see, um, but then a photosynthetic partner, whether or not a, a bacterium or a an alga, um, and then other partners too, other bacteria, other yeasts. The more people dig into lichens, the more organisms they find within lichens. Um, people used to think that it was just two partners, a, a, the alga and a fungus, but it's become very clear that this is a simplification. Um, and the more we dig, the more partners we find. But what's amazing is that within a lichen, these, these you know, a lichen could not exist um, if it wasn't for this delicate interaction between these partners. And if you have um, situations where you see each of the partners growing separately, um, it looks nothing like the lichen. So the lichen is this very much this emergent form. It's a bit like um, the elements of hydrogen and oxygen, which are both combustible gases. If you bring them together, they form water, which is uh, totally not what you would expect from the fusion of those two things. And it's a bit like that with lichens. The forms that you see, we're often very elaborate forms, very striking, beautiful forms, uh, are entirely a, a product of this relationship. And so lichens, this place where ecosystem um, congeals into organism and organism frays into ecosystem. And they prompted all sorts of questions about how it is that organisms live together since uh, this dual hypothesis, as it was called, of lichens uh, was first proposed in the 19th century. And in fact, it was in the study of lichens that this word symbiosis was first brought into biology to describe the living together of organisms um, in a way that wasn't just 
uh, pathogenic or, or parasitic. So can we dig, dig deeper into that actually? I'd love to know, so with, with lichens, where are we? Uh, like, what do we know, but what are the next big questions? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the big, the lichen world has been shaken up in recent years by the discovery that um, there is in, in some lineages of lichen, that there's a, a whole additional uh, fungal partner, um, a type of yeast. Um, and, then, and then it's been shaken up again, um, in, in even, even more recently by the discovery that there's a whole other type of partner, uh, a, a, another fungal partner. And um, so right now, the question is, um, well, there are lots of questions with lichens, but how is it that they, uh, the researcher called, who's doing the most to, um, to worry these categories is someone called Toby Sprabilla in, in America, and he's, um, or in Canada rather, and he's, he's now asking questions about how the bacterial members you know there, there are all these members which are part of a lichen and you can always find them as part of a lichen but but what is it that they're doing that that um holds the whole package together that draws the whole package together into a stable relationship and and so there's this question of you know how do how how do stable relationships arise out of the, you know so many different partners and um and how um what do these partners do for each other that allow them to fall into a stable relationship? One of these very exciting um, recent findings was that actually you don't just have to use partners that normally form lichens, like a, a familiar lichen fungus and a familiar lichen alga, um, but you can bring together a fungus and an alga that have not had a previous relationship, evolutionary speaking, uh, and put them together and provided each of them can do something that the other one can't, they'll fall into a new symbiotic relationship in the, in the process of days. So um, 10 days or so, and you can see the birth of whole new symbiotic relationships. So it seems that um, these relationships form quite readily. It's just that each partner needs to be able to do something the other one can't. And as long as that happens, then they can uh, establish the conditions for, for a whole new relationship to arise. In the, in the book, you put it so eloquently, I think, when you say it's not a matter of what the who the singers are, or what the songs that mm. they're doing. And again, that seems almost revolutionary that, that these symbioses are not something which is necessarily intricate and baked in, but that there's a rising opportunistically. Mm. Do we know what it is that makes fungi so special to be these kind of master negotiators? That's a really good question. And um, they're very flexible and they're inventive, you know, in, in evolutionary terms. Um, they have inventive metabolisms. They're able to you know, digest a great number of different things. Um, they're able to adapt to new kinds of food and to, to um, so innovate metabolically, to dig out an enzyme they might not have used for a very long time, um, to repurpose an enzyme that might be um, traditionally used for something else but which they're using in the service of a new cause so there's a kind of flexibility and a kind of inventiveness and i think that is a big part of um, what it takes to fall into these new relationships um and um and also because funky live their lives so enmeshed with their environment you know they, they, their bodies aren't um, neatly bounded like ours they um, they pour themselves into their surroundings. And so it's harder for them to avoid contact, I think. Um, they have bacteria that live in them. They have bacteria that travel on their networks like highways through the soil. At the same time, they can be wrapped around the roots of plants and hunting worms. Um, and so there's, there's, um, contact is unavoidable and, and they have to make sense of that context, biologically speaking, somehow, um, because that's what their lives depend on. So I think part of them is part of it is their flexibility, and part of it is the um, is their intimate contact and and, and the constant um, challenges they're presented with uh, as as living their lives uh, firmly embedded in their in their surroundings. And as, I suppose that embeddedness to, to again, I know I'm quoting you back to yourself, but the the idea that we are animals that put we are beings that put food into us, and they are beings that put themselves into food. So their very survival is from that enmeshed nature that they have. So I suppose in that case, what, what is the next step? Because as it is something which is ubiquitous, but very often invisible, we are still constantly finding that, that these fungi are ultra useful to us, um, be that in cultivation of plants that we currently can't, be it in changing plants that we can, and be it even medically so. Can you give us some highlights for that? Mm -hmm. 
So, of course, humans have been using fungi for as long as we've been humans and for longer, you know, as medicines, as food. If you think about bread or uh, alcohol um, or miso, soy sauce, cheese, these very uh, staple features of human diets. Uh, these are all, um, these will speak to long-standing fungal relationships and uh, fungal technologies that, that we've uh, learned to, to work with. And so moving forwards, there are plenty. I mean, actually more recent years, there's of course been lots as well. Like think about penicillin, that's a very famous example of a, of a medicine produced by a fungus um, that we've repurposed to serve a human cause and it's changed the course of you know, modern medicine. There are many similar examples. So um, moving forwards, this is the medical piece is a big one. You know, fungi are metabolically ingenious and they produce all sorts of compounds that, um, that we can use for um, as cures or as defensive compounds or as immune boosting compounds. And one of the big recent discoveries has been that um, fungal antiviral compounds can prolong the life of bees and to help to stave off colony collapse disorder. So not just medicines for humans, but medicines for the organisms that humans depend on. Um, so that's one very exciting avenue, which I think will constantly be throwing up surprises uh, and, and we'll see lots of excitement from there um, as the years go past. And Another totally different angle is, is building materials. So using fungi to um, fungal mycelium to grow through a substrate of some sort, say corn stalks or sawdust, to produce um, sustainable building materials that you can use as packaging or as bricks or as board um, or to make a kind of leather-like material. And so this is very exciting because it means you can grow, you can disrupt polluting industries or unsustainable industries um, using a fungal material that's grown on a waste product in a matter of days. And so um, that's whole, that's one other avenue. Um, other avenues include using fungi to break down pollutants or to break down uh, recalcitrant materials that would otherwise become pollutants. Um, this is sometimes known as microremediation. And um, this is at the beginning of its um, you know, this is it's still early days for microremediation. There are no big, uh, large scale applications at the moment, but it's a very exciting field of study because fungi are so able to digest and their lives depend on being able to digest their surroundings. And so um, can we harness their astonishing digestive powers to, um, to detoxify uh, things that would otherwise um, toxify our environment. So that's one other um, avenue. And um, another is food. You know, producing new types of um, meat substitute, growing you know, new foods using mycelium. People are doing astonishing things with uh, mycelial foods. And again, this is something you can grow very rapidly. You can grow, um, you can grow inside. You don't need to cut down a forest. You, you know, and also just mushrooms, growing mushrooms as foods. This is a hugely exciting thing. You can grow high value crop on a waste material in a matter of days. Um, you can grow all the around. So there are lots of um, ways that fungi could transform the um the food situation as well, well and there are other examples too but leave it well, well you, just when you're saying other examples one of the ones that occurs to me is that it's even conserving and looking after some of the food security that we already have so i am always constantly surprised by how many things we don't actually know how to farm and it seems that fungi may well may well hold the key um mm -hmm. how you say the flavor of a strawberry can be changed by the fungi that is working with it, as it were. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a big one, of course. So plants plants depend on, on fungi, as we've discussed. And, and so um, all the plants that we've cultivated, whenever we cultivate a plant, you know, long before mycorrhizal fungi had been identified and named by modern scientists in, in Europe in the 19th century, um, we've been cultivating plants for a very long time. And in doing so tacitly, we've been cultivating fungal relationships. And so traditional agricultural practices that, that place great value on the richness of the soil, soil health, soil fertility, you know, and spend a great deal of effort building up the fertility of the soil. Um, these practices also are, are farming fungi, you know, without necessarily thinking about it, but industrial agriculture um, starting in the 20th century with huge applications of chemical uh, fertilizers and pesticides and um, including fungicides have and it's, that's arisen without thinking about the life of the soil and so it's caused great damage and so as we try to pivot or rein in these damaging practices and start to envision a, a more sustainable way of uh, relating to 
um, the plants that we grow. Um, where we're thinking about the harvest maybe in 20 years time, not just the harvest this year. Yes. Um, then fungi will play a huge role because they already have, you know, they all, and so, so a lot of it will be, a lot of the things we can do to help this happen is to stop doing the things that we know disrupt fungal life and microbial life in the soil, um, like large applications of fertilizers and pesticides. And, and, and by doing so, the fungal, um, the, the, the fungal networks will be able to engage and to start to do what they naturally do. And of course, we can optimize that. And people are starting to think about how we can breed crops that form you know, more functioning relationships with their fungal partners. Because for the last little while, crops have been bred without much thought to their ability to form symbiotic relationships. So can, can, we, can we breed higher functioning symbionts? Um, can we breed fungi that are higher functioning symbionts? You know, can we start to think about these crops um, as collective crops rather than as these monocultures? Yeah, all this always shows me that uh, when you look at the fungal world, we basically see hippies are right. Uh, ecology is king <laughs> for this stuff. Everything is interconnected mm. and that we can really benefit ourselves by just simply understanding that. Like to discover that, for instance, porcini mushrooms cannot be farmed is astounding. Mm. You always assume it's something as exotic as a truffle. Um, so before, before we were kind of thinking, I suppose, about this sort of fragility in that case of ecosystems and things, it is still astounding to my mind the hardiness of fungi for things that are so small as well. Can you delve a bit more into that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, fungi have persisted through the six or five great extinction events on the planet, and they've done so by being inventive, inventive and flexible and collaborative, as we've discussed. And of course, a lot of fungi have gone extinct. A lot of the organisms of uh, whatever sort have gone extinct uh, through these big uh, cataclysmic episodes. Um, but Fungi have um, an amazing ability to, to hang on through these difficult periods. So for example, if we think about the KT extinction, the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, uh, an asteroid hits the earth, spits debris halfway to the moon, creates sort of like dust clouds, perpetual winter, um, acid rains, flammable material crashing out the earth, starting fires. It's a real disaster zone, certainly for plants who depend on sunlight um, this is a very difficult time, so forests die back across the globe, um, creating a kind of compost heap, a global compost heap, in which these decomposing fungi can really thrive. Uh, so in that situation, the whole swathes of the fungal kingdom have given this massive boost, have this, um, this real big period of uh, boom and innovation, um, and and the whole swathes of the fungal kingdom, again, won't have that, because they all, there's some whole loads of the fungal kingdom depend on having living plants around. Uh, so some fungi can you know, be, respond to a, a crisis um, in one way and a load of other fungi can respond to a crisis in a different ways. So it's not that they're all um, tough, but, um, but this kind of flexibility is something that we see again and again in the history of, um, in the history of fungi. And certainly uh, fungi forms, the lichens, for example, are very, they're ex known as extremophiles because they can survive very extreme conditions. They live um, in, for example, in the Antarctic dry valleys, which are seared with radiation and very dry and very cold and often used to approximate conditions on Mars. And there are lichens there that uh, are unfazed by these conditions um, and, and can make a, a runaway success of life there. So there are cases where fungi are actually uh, extremophilic. I, I guess that does seem to be taking them back to the very start that these were some of the things that crawled out of the sea first took advantage of you know earth in the days before there was such a an atmosphere conducive to the kind of life that we know now um i suppose we, we've all been guilty uh, as, as a cop as sorry i suppose a culture is sort of guilty of looking at these things because we can't see them and assuming that they are simple but the complexity seems to be enormous so I suppose if there was going to be like one big question you have that maybe you, you uh, want to continue in your research or if there was something that you want to see other people answer when it comes to fungi, what would it be? There are just so many. It's, um, there are so many ways to be a fungus. There are so many ways to think about fungi that um, choosing one is very difficult. But maybe um, one basic question, so a question that's less about you know, a use for humans or, or finding a new technology, one question about the basic biology of fungi is uh, how do they, having these ranging 
um, shape-shifting networks, how do they coordinate this behavior? How can one part of a network stay in touch with another part of a network? Um, and how can they behave as a unified whole while having no brain or no centralized uh, part of their bodies to process that information, to link uh, perception and action? Um, this is really big puzzling questions for us as, as centralized humans who like our brains, understandably. Um, but um, these kind of questions are, are really exciting ones in fungal biology because they seem very basic and yet uh, we really aren't very clear on how this happens. So if I had to choose a, a general question with regard to basic fungal biology, then that might be, um, that might be one of them. Um, and with regard to, to applied fungal biology, you know, fungal biology that, that might have use for us, um, or might help us deal with some of the crises that we're facing. Um, there are just so many. I'd like to see whole um, whole institutes of applied mycology starting up with funding um, sort of lots of high risk grants for you know, projects that are um, really trying out wildly different things. And I think we can foster innovation, um, foster new ways of forming partnerships with fungi to help us deal with this crisis. And I think that would be money really well spent. That, that does seem to be what's actually happening. Is fungi are now insinuating their way into all the various disciplines. Um, I know, again, you mentioned in your book, say, uh, fungal urology, where people are now starting to look more perhaps at how fungi in our gut and our bodies, or that we can consume, will alter and change our minds and our neurology and, and can help with disease and things. But I'd love to go back to that, that thing, that central big question you had of how do you organize something which is shot off in a thousand different directions at one time, because it does seem to be one of those things that people have been working on for so long, and that we are having at least some breakthroughs, would that be correct? Like finding yeah. how about electricity can travel and the like? Yeah, so this is a big one. I mean, this has been very under-researched though. I, I talk about it in the book because it's such an exciting uh, avenue, but there was a study done on this in the 90s and then nothing was, uh, and then, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in on that study. So they were all on the same page, but the study is that, um, a Swedish researcher, it's called Stefan Olsen, put electrodes that are normally used to be being used to insert into moth brains to study the way that the neurons in the moth brains were were firing, how they were um, firing action potentials and um, creating the cerebral activity that you would associate with moth behavior. And so he just stuck these electrodes into a fungal network to see what would happen and, and found that these fungal networks were um, had similar kind of action potential like spikes, so spikes of electrical activity passing along the fungal cells in an analogous way to the way that action potentials pass along animal neurons. And so Stefan thought that this would be a really, um, this would make sense as a way for fungi to communicate with themselves. And, um, and this research has now been picked up a little bit more, but it remains a big, um, exciting frontier about which we know uh, far too little. But it's it tunes in with a, a bigger shift going on right now in biology where um, electrical activity is being found to be a, a very important modulator of um, behavior in animals with no brains or, or with, with organisms with no brains rather. Bacteria, for example, use um, waves of electrical activity to communicate between one side of a colony and another. Um, so this is a very uh, exciting area of biology right now in general and um, with fungi in particular because we know um, so little about their basic communication systems. Well, then I'm very pleased to say at least that the, your book has changed my mind about fungi and I already liked them. So that's uh, something very nice. Mm -hmm. um, thank you ever so much, Merlin. Uh, everybody out there, if you want to check out the book, go to No Alibi or all our good bookstores that are near you. I've been Simon Watts. Do check out the rest of Northern Ireland Science Festival's programme. Actually, if you want to see more of me, check out my immersive theatre piece, The Mirror Trap, and our anarcho-nerd pub quiz, Universally Challenged. Thank you so much, Merlin. Have you got any final things to say before we go? Well, thanks for having me. It's been great to chat. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.